So this is a picture of the organization. That's the DOT. And this graphic uh, uh, represents the silos of excellence. Or you can say the divisions or however you want to look at it. That uh, We've got gaps in between. That uh, We do uh, a lot of good things in here, but these white areas are kind of unknown. Uh, they're not as well defined within the organization. I look at it another way. I can have horizontal lines, and that's looking at the, the supervisory levels. So you have gaps in there. And really what an organization looks like is this. And there's probably more boxes. And these are basically our different functional areas within the organization. And they're usually run very well. But the connectivity isn't there. Typically what happens in those white spaces is that no one person is defined as being responsible for what occurs. It's kind of blurry as to what happens there. There's management blind spots. There's accountability gaps. It's kind of like the cracks in the deck or whatever. Things fall through. You don't. But also these, to me, are the areas of greatest potential. Really, I would say these are the areas, if you're willing to, are where leadership exists. You know, leadership, you need to have a strategic vision or you need to learn how to integrate the different resources that the agency has. It's, it's not a well-defined area. Leadership really usually doesn't occur in well-defined areas. You don't need leadership in well-defined areas. You need leadership where it's not too clear. Where we can look at how, how do we connect some of these things. The problems that we're facing today cannot be done by any one unit within the organization. If you start looking at all the things that we're working on, whether it's track a plow or we could talk about IAPS, uh, the permitting system that requires bridge data, that requires GIS data, uh, clearance data, that requires uh, uh, regulatory information, uh, payment, you name it. In the past, the services that we provided could be pretty much done by one unit. So how do we allow that to occur? That requires leadership. So I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I'm not an expert on leadership. And uh, uh, I've read a lot of books on leadership. I can tell you about the 21 indispensable qualities of a leader from John Maxwell. Or you can, we can hit each one of those and we can be here for a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to approach it from that way. I'm going to only approach it from a really a simple perspective on leadership and what we can do. Just going to hit a few areas. But where do leaders come from? I get hired as a division director. Do I become a leader? I have some individuals that uh, have applied and uh, very good interviews uh, telling me all that they're capable of doing, but I've never seen it. You become a leader when you get your first supervisory position. Are leaders born with these qualities? Well, all leaders are born, unless you're an alien. But, uh, but no, I don't think they're necessarily born. I still have a hard time considering myself as a leader. I, I would say most leaders didn't wake up one day and said, I'm a leader. I, I haven't talked to too many that felt that way. Can these qualities be taught? Is that what it takes? Is it just having this type of session here? 
I believe leaders are discovered by their environment. I believe those of you who are leaders went through a process of self-discovery. You just didn't wake up. Some of these environments are not by choice, in which you discover leadership or that you have it. Someone will just stand up and they'll probably start taking the bull by the horns or, or whatever and start going. I was talking with my uh, uh, administrative assistant, uh, Kathy Mather. She was going, you know, when I was taking a cosmetology class, uh, we had one girl in there who was really flighty and kind of goofy and sometimes causing problems and all that. And we were all kind of wondering what to do with this, this girl. So, you know, why is she in here? She's kind of disruptive. And then one day, uh, one of the other students fell over and had a seizure. And this gal who was exhibiting this type of behavior immediately took charge, knew exactly what to do, gave orders and, and things like that, and just was a leader in that environment. There's people that find out that they're leaders being placed maybe in an environment not by choice. Some environments are somewhat more controlled. We have a lot of environments within this agency that we can somewhat control, whether it's leading a team, maybe it's within a driver's licensing station and you're inundated with customers. That requires leadership or I'm out on a construction project or maybe I'm at a public information meeting and dialoguing with uh, our stakeholders out there. These environments, we need to create environments for individuals that allow discovery of their leadership potential. I think that's one of the number one things we need to do or what I really want to get out of here is that we have the power to create environments that allow people to realize or develop leadership skills. And a lot of these environments, and you know, basically Leadership for Change was really talking about creating that type of environment. We talked about a worker's bill of rights, but when you're talking about employee development, delegation with the purpose, care meetings, understanding, motivation or a cycle of dependency. All those were about creating an environment to allow people to develop these leadership skills. And being a leader doesn't mean that uh, you have a position as recognized in the org chart. There's all times that we've got to step into a leadership position. Some of it might be just talking about what we're doing here as you go back with your peers, ah, what are they doing there? We're not gonna see a change, this won't work. Sometimes leadership is just believing in the best or trying to, uh, to help someone along. Those of us who do have a position of authority in which we can somewhat control the environment, we have an obligation to do this. If you're trying to fill vacant positions in which you require leaders and you're finding you don't have a good pool of applicants, a lot of times I would say shame on you. Because why don't you? Why aren't they able to show leadership? And this one, the bottom one's a pet peeve of mine. We gotta quit making people pay their dues. We got this feeling that uh, if I got a new person in, that uh, I'm gonna give them the junk work or they gotta do the menial task or they, they've gotta learn the system. And we're really squandering potential, especially when we get young individuals directly out of school or we get someone from another uh, area outside of the department. They have unique perspectives. They can see our blind spots. 
They can challenge the system. We need that. Young people, I don't want to teach them how to file well or do mundane work. I want them to, to really develop mental pathways that don't. You know, a young individual right out of college, their mind is not yet fully developed. And in some cases, they don't realize that maybe they should be incapable of doing what you're asking them, and yet they do it. How many times have you been amazed? I think the intern program is just amazing some of the work that we're getting out of individuals. Whether it was investigations in, uh, in motor vehicle, or we have a, a gentleman in GIS who was uh, helping us develop some applications there that he got recognized by the president of Esri, which is the largest GIS firm in the world of what we're trying to do here. Now, we could have gave those individuals just mundane work just to fill, fill a slot. It's very wasteful. We, we, we got to quit that. We got to develop every resource that we have to its fullest potential. So how do you do that? One thing is evaluate the type of leader that you are. Observe those who work for you. Are they leaders? If they aren't, you might need to question whether you're a leader. Because really, good leaders multiply themselves. My desire within my division is that those who report to me, that they're capable of leading on their own. That I'm not necessary. Really, my role, as I look at it, in my position of authority, is to eliminate barriers, develop people, and allow them to be successful. My role is not to make the, uh, to answer all the questions, uh, to make all the decisions. It's really to challenge those who report to me and make them leaders. I really want to make myself replaceable. I'll find something else to do. But the dependency shouldn't be upon me. My role should really be how can I develop these individuals? Are you threatened by one of them performing a task better than you? Do you have some that work for you that might be smarter than you? Are you threatened by that? Shouldn't be. I'll tell you, the best leaders in the world surround themselves with the smartest people. And really, their skill as a leader is how do you get them all to work as a team? Not that you're smarter than them, but how do you get them to work together? Now, I look at my division. I think I'm the only one but one that has a bachelor's degree, everybody else has an advanced degree that reports to me. So I'm probably, in terms of the world's view, in terms on paper and on resume, I have the least qualifications. Am I threatened by that? I'm not. I think that's great. I want to have good people working for me. Can you lose some good people that are working for you? Probably you can. But it's up to you to create an environment that challenges and stretches them. And again, as we learned in Leadership for Change, what motivates people? Money isn't the only motivation. It's for them having a part, typically, of making a difference. Do you give people the freedom to doubt, to challenge you? Do you give them the ability to say, hey, you know, I, am, I don't agree with this or I'm struggling, or you're threatened by that, you shouldn't be. You're getting some good, honest feedback if you allow it to occur. And then what has shaped your definition of leadership? I think you need to look at that. Who was your mentor? Who taught you what a leader is? Who was that person? And was it the right perspective? 
know, my father was in the military, and you would think as uh, someone in the military, he would be very authoritarian. Uh, he was not an officer. He was enlisted. Actually, he ran away from home at age 16 and joined the military and went over to Europe. He ended up being the top uh, enlisted individual at Offutt Air Force Base, uh, reporting to the colonel there. And I remember as a young boy, I think I was probably only like 10, he goes, John, I've seen many second lieutenants come in to the service and your people will either make you or break you. Your people are important, the way you treat them. I've seen many young lieutenants come in figuring they knew all the answers. They did not take input. They had this chip on their shoulders. He goes, I never want you to be like that. That's stuck. That's going. OK, where did this come from? Must have been a bad day at the office, but uh, came in. So there could be someone like that, and maybe not in a positive way. I told you what a leader. It's difficult out in the field. I remember when I first became an RME, I was 30 years old, and all the garage supervisors were probably in their mid-50s or later. I never worked for the DOT. I never worked maintenance. I worked at a consultant firm on how to test concrete and asphalt. So all of a sudden, I'm out here trying to make a decision at an interstate garage, talking with the supervisor there. So very quickly, I, I said, well, what, what are we going to do here? And the garage supervisor challenged me and goes, well, you're the boss. You make the decision. How many of you are in an environment in which Really, uh, an unreasonable expectation is placed upon you because of your position of authority. Don't let that happen. I had to push back and say, no, that's not how I operate. You've been here longer than I have. You understand the environment. You understand some of the background. I want to understand what your perspective. And then we'll collaborate. We'll talk together about how we're going to approach this problem. Just because I'm the RME doesn't make me the decision maker. But you'll get some of that pushback. There's some feeling out there, some people would say that um, we give too much, we expect too much accountability from those with authority and not enough accountability from those without authority. That makes sense to you. A lot of times it's easier to deflect that off to who is, quote, the formal leader. And I'll talk about this later because is it a risk aversion thing? Is it not wanting to be held accountable for part of the decision? There is risk involved. So as a leader, I would say you need to be a multiplier. And again, this is whether you're formal or non-formal. And these are kind of different uh, ways of, uh, if you want to use a broad classification on how people lead. There are multipliers and there are diminishers. So how would a diminisher manage talent? They'll, they'll use talent, where a multiplier will develop. A diminisher will approach mistakes or failures by assigning blame. A multiplier will use it for exploration, for understanding. A diminisher will set direction by telling, or a multiplier will challenge. A diminisher will decide, or a multiplier will consult. To get things done, a diminisher will control the process where a multiplier will support the process. Research has shown that those individuals identified being with a diminisher style of leadership feel that they're only utilized 20 to 50 percent of their capabilities. Some of you probably work for a diminisher. 
And so people really feel they have much more to offer. While those working for a multiplier say they, they feel 70 to 100% of their capabilities are being utilized. That's a good return on investment if you're a multiplier. If you learn how to change your approach in developing or creating environments, you potentially have the ability to double your output or your effect. Do you believe that? Everybody believes their plate's full. But if you're under the wrong leadership style, only 50% of it's really effective. So what type of environment are you creating with your leadership style? To meet our future challenges, we need current and future leaders. We need an environment that both challenges and supports discovery. Both of that is required. And I'll talk you know, a little bit about risk. So risk to the leader or to the manager to create that environment to allow that to occur. But those in which you want to develop leadership skills, there's a risk they got to take. They're going to be put into a situation that they're not comfortable with. How many have kids? How many times do they want you to solve problems for them? All the time? And when you don't, you're a bad parent, right? Just give me the answer, just fix it. You know, it, it can be simple things about, uh, you know, maybe there was something wrong with the bank or whatever. I always made my kids, you're going to call them first. You're, you're going to try and straighten it out first. My kids were upset with me at that point. But at this point, they're not, as they've grown. It took them a while to understand. It's the same thing with, with developing people within the organization. You, there's going to be pushback in cases. An environment that allows challenging conversations broadens perspectives. In our staff meeting yesterday, we had pretty challenging conversation. We talked about risk and, and the impact of being at will and uh, is this a risk adverse organization or not or how has that changed your approach to problem solving? There was a lot of uncomfortableness in there. I don't think because lack of trust, it was just a conversation that wasn't usually held. Some of these conversations, we just like to sweep under the rug and not, not talk about them. The challenging conversations really do broaden perspectives. I know all on the management team really want to hear, and that's why we have, this is a different conference in which we really want, I don't want you to tickle my ears in, in the breakout sessions as to what do we need to do? What you feel are the right ways of making this organization better? Let's get them out. I don't have all the answers. An environment that allows, even encourages risk is necessary to achieve the greatest potential. Do you agree with that? Anyone not agree? I would say, you know, with risk, you, you can't really achieve any, any greatness without risk. Risk is an interesting term. I would say when people hear the term risk, they gravitate towards the negative. You always, typically, I do think risk is being a negative. But risk is like yin and yang. There's positive consequences. A positive consequence is a risk. And a negative consequence is a risk. So risk really is a, is a neutral term. But we gravitate towards the negative side of risk. 
I'm going to pose some questions out here. Looking at the changes that I show just on the technology side, comparing today's world to say 20 years ago, is today's world riskier? So again, looking at that, there, there can be substantial consequences to what we're capable of today or substantial benefits. How many were ever reading about the, the super collider over in Europe? Anybody read about the super collider in Europe? Does anybody know what the risk is that they think might happen with it? Black holes. Right? But you might create a black hole, a micro black hole. That'd be pretty bad if that happened. This conference would be over pretty quick. We'll, we'll be hitting that event horizon pretty quick that Paul talks about, that it might be a little bit different looking uh, if that happens. For a lot of us growing up, the risk of nuclear war. I remember ducking under desks. Anyone else do that? We had to prepare. I don't know what we were doing under the desk. Cause wasn't going to do much. Maybe just make us feel good. But there are tremendous potentials out there, too, which I think we're trying to exploit. In today's challenging environment, is risk aversion skewed to negative consequences? If we take an approach of putting our head in the sand, do you think that's skewed more towards negative consequences versus positive consequences? My feeling is that they're negative. But choosing to do nothing, choosing to maybe ignore what's happening, choosing to protect what you have today actually puts you at a higher chance of negative risk. or even waiting. You know, we have concerns, and I think as an agency, we need to look at that. We have concerns about what's the governor's budget going to look like? What does that mean in terms of staffing? What is the size of the DOT going to be? Now, one approach is that, OK, we just sit and wait. And then we decide what to do, put the decision off for the planning. Or in other ways, should we be creating scenarios? Should we look at, well, we stay the same, we have minimal reductions, we have medium reductions, we have large reductions, and we start planning out now what that future may look like. You know, part of looking at risk is having those discussions and trying to figure that out so that we're, we're not a victim of what's happening out here, that we need to start having those conversations. Those conversations are risky. Those conversations make anybody feel good when we have them? Don't make me feel good. Can leadership exist in an environment devoid of risk? I think like good and bad or positive and negative, leadership cannot exist without risk. Leadership lives in a risk environment. If you're, if you're living in a risk adverse or trying to live in a risk adverse world, then I'm saying you're probably not a leader. Can leadership be discovered without risk? There's got to be a potential cost. Is the department risk adverse? I've heard in some of the leadership for change, yes, it is risk adverse. 
a lot when I'm trying to get some feedback on it, it's not that well defined. You know, it's kind of like, uh, if you remember Bill Smitley, the, the facility is dirty. And we need to do the breakdown structure. And we finally find out a Thursday afternoon at such and such a time in the men's rest, restroom, there's paper towels on the floor. If we do have this, we need to define it better. What, what do we mean by risk aversion in the agency? Because I'm very interested in that. You know, especially as at will, we had a good discussion on this. You know, myself as an at will employee, was I comfortable in being at will? I wasn't super comfortable, I wasn't super uncomfortable. But I can say personally for me, was I ever worried about internal risk or within the organization about my job being online for taking a chance on something? I've never felt that. I think the greatest risk that I've ever felt is that politically, if the administration changes and, and we, we have a political appointment here and they want to do house cleaning, that was probably the only risk that I was really worried about. I, I, I've never been really worried about internal departmental risk or consequences. And I would really say, you know, on the, on, on the time that we had the panel discussion, I'm hoping someone will bring up if they feel that this is an issue, that this is really brought up as to what is management team's philosophy on risk or, or other departmental issues. I, I'm hoping someone doesn't write in that, uh, when will I be able to get an iPad? I, uh, hopefully we're gonna have broader. I'm, Forgive me if someone already wrote that in there, but uh, okay. But I, I think these these conversations need to be had. Oh, Morgan, it's right on time. We're not going to have dialogue. The last question. This is it. And this is the last of the presentation. And really, this is to me the most important one. Are you willing to take a risk for what we're trying to show here? Are you willing to grab on and create the department that we want? Because risk is involved. And my hope, and I know management team, is that you'll join us in taking this risk and moving us forward and meeting the challenges of the future. I thank you with that. <laughs>